In the heart of a bustling city, amidst the rhythm of the streets and the pulse of the music, there lived a man whose name echoed through the corridors of history like a melody James Brown. His life was a symphony of triumphs and tribulations, a journey that captivated the world with its highs and lows. His music transcended barriers, uniting people from all walks of life in a harmonious celebration of rhythm and soul. But behind the glittering facade of fame lay a man haunted by demons that threatened to unravel his legacy. James battled addiction and legal troubles, stumbling through the shadows as he struggled to find his way back to the light. Join us as we delve into the tragic yet captivating story of the life and death of James Brown, a legend whose impact transcends generations. James Brown, the iconic American musician, left behind a lasting legacy that extended far beyond his music. Famously dubbed the Godfather of Soul, Brown's impact on the music industry and culture at large was profound. At the time of his passing in 2006, he had amassed a considerable fortune, estimated at $100 million. A significant portion of Brown's wealth was attributed to his termination rights, a legal provision under federal copyright law. These rights allow artists or their heirs to reclaim ownership of their work after a certain period, enabling them to earn income from licensing and royalties. In Brown's case, his termination rights became a valuable asset, with his heirs eventually enjoying full control over his catalog. The value of Brown's musical catalog was highlighted in 2015 when Tommy Ray Heine, one of his heirs, sold a portion of her termination rights to five of his songs to Warner Chappelle Music for a substantial sum of $2 million. This transaction underscored the enduring popularity and commercial viability of Brown's music. Brown's influence transcended generations and genres, as evidenced by tributes paid to him by renowned artists like the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin's Jimmy Page. The Rolling Stones honored Brown during their 2007 European tour by covering his song, I'll Go Crazy, while Page described Brown as a musical genre unto himself, emphasizing his continual evolution and innovation. In recognition of his contributions to music, the inaugural, tribute fit for the King of King Records, was held on December 22, 2007, at the Madison Theater in Covington, Kentucky. Hosted by Bootsy Collins, the event featured performances by artists such as Africa Bambata, Chuck D of Public Enemy, and the Soul Generals, among others. The occasion also saw the declaration of December 22 as James Brown Day by the mayor of Cincinnati, further cementing Brown's legacy in the annals of music history. James Brown, born on May 3, 1933, in a small wooden shack in Barnwell, South Carolina, Brown entered the world amidst poverty and hardship. His mother, Susie, just 16 at the time, struggled to provide for her family in the impoverished town of Elko. The family's circumstances forced them to relocate to Augusta, Georgia, when James was only five years old. Initially residing in one of his aunt's brothels, they later moved into a shared house with another aunt, where young James spent his formative years. Brown's childhood was marked by instability and adversity. His parents' troubled marriage, marred by controversy and abuse, led to his mother's departure to New York, leaving James behind. Despite the challenges, Brown managed to attend school until the sixth grade, although he often found himself alone and fending for himself on the streets. It was during this time that Brown discovered his passion for music. He honed his musical skills by teaching himself to play the piano, harmonica, and guitar. His talent soon caught the attention of those around him, and he began performing in talent shows and entertaining troops from Camp Gordon with his bucket dances during the onset of World War II. However, Brown's path was not without its obstacles. At the age of 16, he found himself on the wrong side of the law, convicted of robbery and sentenced to a juvenile detention center. Yet, even in the confines of incarceration, Brown's musical spirit remained undimmed. He formed a gospel quartet with fellow inmates, showcasing his innate musical prowess. In a turn of fate, Brown was granted a pardon in June 1952, marking a pivotal moment in his life. Freed from the constraints of confinement, he seized the opportunity to pursue his musical aspirations wholeheartedly. Joining the gospel group, the Ever Ready Gospel Singers, Brown embarked on a new chapter in his musical journey, laying the foundation for his future success. James Brown's illustrious career traces back to his roots in a gospel group known as the Gospel Starlighters, which later morphed into the flames. With Brown leading the charge, the group embarked on a whirlwind tour across the southern United States, gracing numerous venues with their electrifying performances. Influenced by R&B icons like Little Richard and Ray Charles, their early recordings resonated with audiences, culminating in the release of their breakout R&B hit, Please, in March 1956. 
which soared to the top of the charts, selling over a million copies. As Brown's musical journey unfolded, he transitioned into a solo artist, continually evolving his sound. In October 1958, he achieved his first solo number one hit with Try Me, marking the beginning of a string of 17 chart topping R&B hits. The momentum only grew as Brown and his band achieved further success with covers like Night Train in 1962, alongside original ballads like Lost Someone and Baby You're Right. In a bold move, Brown personally financed a live recording of one of his performances at the Apollo Theater in 1962. Persuading Sid Nathan to release the album, Live at the Apollo, hit the shelves the following summer and swiftly ascended the charts, peaking at number two on the top LP chart and enjoying a remarkable 14-month run. Ever the innovator, Brown ventured into entrepreneurship in 1963, establishing his own label, Try Me Records. His creative prowess bore fruit with the release of Papa's Got a Brand New Bag in 1965, a chart-topping sensation that earned him his first Grammy Award. Undeterred, Brown continued his winning streak with hits like I Got You, which secured his second consecutive number one single, and the soulful ballad, It's a Man's 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 World, further solidifying his dominance on both the pop and R&B charts. The late 60s and early 70s witnessed Brown's ascent to the forefront of the funk music scene, as he pioneered a revolutionary sound that captivated audiences worldwide. With his unparalleled talent and relentless drive, James Brown carved out a legacy that transcended generations, cementing his status as a true musical icon. James Brown's musical journey reached new heights from 1970 to 1975, earning him the revered title of the Godfather of Soul. Throughout this period, Brown showcased his versatility by seamlessly blending gospel, rhythm and blues, funk, and traditional African music into his distinctive sound. As the 70s unfolded, Brown adeptly responded to shifting musical trends, experimenting with disco elements, albeit with mixed success. While some of his disco-infused tracks failed to replicate the success of his earlier hits, they remain iconic in today's music landscape. In 1974, Brown's Papa Don't Take No Mess emerged as a standout, clinching the number one spot on the R&B chart and serving as his final top 40 pop single of the decade, signifying the culmination of an era. The subsequent decade saw Brown grappling with fluctuations in both popularity and sales. However, a pivotal turning point came in 1986 when he inked a deal with Scotty Brothers Records and released the album, Gravity. The album boasted the infectious track, Living in America, which reignited Brown's career with its top 10 pop hit status, marking his first since 1968. Featured prominently in the film, Rocky IV, and its soundtrack, the song catapulted Brown back into the spotlight, reaffirming his status as a musical force to be reckoned with. Capitalizing on his renewed success, Brown penned his autobiography, James Brown, The Godfather of Soul, in collaboration with Bruce Tucker, offering fans a glimpse into his extraordinary life and career. His resurgence culminated in a Grammy Award win for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance for Living in America in 1987, further solidifying his enduring legacy. A momentous event in Brown's later years was the electrifying live performance at the Wiltern Theater on June 10, 1991. Dubbed, James Brown, Live in America Live, the concert, conceived by Indiana producer Danny Hubbard, featured an array of luminaries, including MC Hammer, Belle Biv DeVoe, En Vogue, and Quincy Jones, paying tribute to the indelible Mark Brown had left on the music industry. With appearances by iconic figures like Ice-T, Tone Locke, and Cool Mo D, the event was a testament to Brown's enduring influence and unmatched talent. In 1993, he unveiled his album, Universal James, which featured his final Billboard charting single, Can't Get Any Harder. Although the track made a modest impact on the US R&B chart, reaching number 76, its reception in the UK was more notable, peaking at number 59, likely buoyed by the success of a remix version of his classic hit, I Feel Good, featuring Dakeen. Despite subsequent singles like, How Long, and Georgelina, failing to chart, Brown persisted in his musical endeavors. In 1995, Brown returned to the iconic Apollo Theater to record, live at the Apollo 1995, a testament to his enduring connection with his audience. Despite including a studio track titled, Respect Me, as a single, the album failed to make a significant impact on the charts. A highlight of Brown's later years came in 2004 when he opened for the Red Hot Chili Peppers at several Hyde Park concerts in London showcasing his enduring appeal to audiences worldwide. The following year saw the publication of his second book, 
I feel good, a memoir of a life of soul, offering fans a deeper insight into his remarkable journey. In early 2005, Brown embarked on recording sessions for a planned studio album with longtime collaborators like Fred Wesley and Pee Wee Ellis. Although the album never materialized, a track from these sessions, Gut Bucket, appeared on a compilation CD. Brown's final major U.S. performance took place in San Francisco in August 2006. Headlining the Golden Gate Festival, Fogfest, to rave reviews. His last shows, including a memorable appearance at the Irish Oxygen Festival, drew packed audiences, underscoring his enduring appeal as a live performer. In a poignant moment, Brown took to the stage for the BBC's Electric Proms in October 2006, delivering a captivating performance supported by the Zootons and featuring special appearances by Max Beasley and the Sugar Babes. Despite his advancing age, Brown's energy and charisma remained undimmed, captivating audiences until the end. Brown's final television appearance came in November 2006 when he was posthumously inducted into the UK Music Hall of Fame, a fitting tribute to his unparalleled contribution to the world of music. Tragically, Brown passed away in December 2006, leaving behind a legacy that continues to inspire and resonate with audiences worldwide. His planned duet with Annie Lennox on the song, Vengeance, for her album, Venus, released in 2007, stands as a testament to his enduring influence and his commitment to his craft until the very end. In the tumultuous landscape of the 1960s, James Brown emerged as more than just a music icon. He became a beacon of social activism, fueled by his own struggles and a fervent belief in the power of education. Social activities. Brown's journey from a challenging childhood, marked by his forced withdrawal from school due to something as trivial as inadequate clothing, to a position where he could champion the cause of education for young people, is emblematic of his resilience and determination. Recognizing the alarming rates of high school dropouts plaguing the era, Brown used his platform to release the pro-education anthem, Don't Be a Dropout. The song not only resonated with audiences but also served as a catalyst for tangible change. Proceeds from its success were funneled into charity programs aimed at curbing the dropout crisis, reflecting Brown's commitment to making a difference beyond the realm of music. His advocacy caught the attention of President Lyndon B. Johnson, who hailed Brown as a positive role model for youth. This recognition culminated in a historic meeting at the White House, where Brown's influence transcended the boundaries of entertainment to address pressing social issues. However, Brown's impact extended far beyond the confines of Capitol Hill. In the wake of Martin Luther King Jr.'s tragic assassination on April 4, 1968, Brown sprang into action, organizing a monumental free concert at the Boston Garden the very next day. In a city fraught with tension and on the brink of unrest, Brown's concert served as a beacon of hope, offering solace and unity to a grieving community. Yet, behind the scenes, Brown's negotiation with then-Mayor Kevin White revealed the complexity of his activism. Angered by the revelation that his performance would be broadcast for free on public television without his knowledge, Brown demanded compensation to offset potential losses in ticket sales. This standoff underscored Brown's unwavering commitment to his principles and highlighted the intricate dynamics of power and influence at play. Ultimately, White mobilized a group of influential figures, dubbed the vault, to secure the funds necessary to meet Brown's demands. This behind-the-scenes maneuvering not only salvaged the concert but also underscored the significance of Brown's message in a time of turmoil. Following the success of the Boston concert, Brown found himself thrust into a new role as a mediator in cities ravaged by riots in the aftermath of King's assassination. President Johnson, recognizing Brown's ability to bridge divides, implored him to advocate for peace and nonviolence in communities grappling with grief and anger. In the midst of the civil rights movement, James Brown emerged as a pivotal figure, not only in the realm of music but also as a vocal advocate for black empowerment and social justice. Responding to mounting pressure from black activists like H. Rap Brown, Brown took a bold stance by penning the iconic lyrics of, Say it loud I'm black and I'm proud. Collaborating with his bandleader Alfred, Pee Wee, Ellis, Brown infused the song with a potent message of pride and defiance against racial oppression. Released during a tumultuous summer, the song swiftly became an anthem for the civil rights movement, resonating deeply with audiences across the nation. Its impact was undeniable, yet Brown himself harbored mixed feelings about its legacy. In a candid moment of reflection in 1984, he expressed regret over recording the song, citing concerns about its potential to perpetuate separatism and racial division. However, despite his reservations, Brown's commitment to social causes remained steadfast throughout his life.
Beyond the stage, he tirelessly championed the importance of education, delivering public speeches in schools and allocating a significant portion of his estate to establish the I Feel Good, Inc. Trust. This foundation aimed to uplift disadvantaged children through scholarships and support. Moreover, Brown used his platform to address pressing issues plaguing communities, particularly the scourge of violence affecting young lives. His final single, Killing Is Out, School Is In, served as a poignant reminder of the urgent need to prioritize the safety and well-being of children, advocating against the senseless loss of life on the streets. Despite his political affiliations, which notably included headlining a fundraiser for the National Republican Senate Committee in 2003, Brown's love for his country and his enduring commitment to community welfare remained unwavering. Following the passing of figures like Ronald Reagan and his close friend Ray Charles, Brown expressed profound grief, reflecting on their shared experiences and the enduring impact of their legacies. Even in his final days, battling illness, Brown continued to exemplify compassion and generosity. Just a week before his passing, he made a heartfelt donation of toys and turkeys to children at an Atlanta orphanage, a gesture reflective of his lifelong dedication to uplifting those in need. Personal Life James Brown, known as the Godfather of Soul, had a tumultuous personal life marked by controversy and complex relationships. In 1962, Tammy Terrell joined Brown's touring show, The James Brown Review, as a young singer just 17 years old. During their time together, Brown engaged in a relationship with Terrell, which included instances of physical abuse. Bobby Bennett, a former member of Brown's backing group, The Famous Flames, recalled witnessing Brown's abuse of Terrell, saying he saw her bleeding and shedding blood. Terrell's time with Brown was fraught with difficulty, eventually leading her to escape the relationship. She later found fame as Marvin Gaye's singing partner in the mid-1960s before her untimely death in 1970. Brown's marriages also drew significant attention, particularly because of allegations of domestic abuse. His first marriage to Velma Warren in 1953 ended in 1969, but the two maintained a close friendship until Brown's death. His second marriage to Deidre, Dee Dee, Jenkins lasted from 1970 to 1981, producing two daughters. This marriage was also marked by domestic abuse, as reported by their daughter. His third marriage was to Adrian Lois Rodriguez in 1984, which ended with Rodriguez filing for divorce in 1988, citing years of cruel treatment. Rodriguez died in 1996. Brown's fourth marriage to Tommy Ray Heine occurred in 2002 but was later invalidated due to Heine's failure to annul a prior marriage before marrying Brown. This marriage was embroiled in legal disputes following Brown's death, with questions surrounding its validity and Heine's rights to Brown's estate. Ultimately, the South Carolina Supreme Court ruled in 2020 that Heine was not legally married to Brown. The complexities of Brown's estate extend to his numerous children and familial ties. He acknowledged nine children, including five sons and six daughters, as well as having at least eight grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. His eldest son, Teddy, tragically passed away in a car accident in 1973. Further complicating the narrative, DNA testing in 2007 revealed that Brown fathered at least three children out of wedlock. Among them was LaRonda Pettit, a retired flight attendant and teacher responding in Houston. Another child, Michael Dion Brown, was born in 1968 to marry Florence Brown. Although Brown did not contest paternity in 1983, he never formally acknowledged Michael as his son. The contentious disputes over Brown's estate also involved questions of paternity for his son James Brown Jr., as Heine sought legal representation for him in paternity proceedings. DNA testing confirms Brown Jr. as Brown's biological son, providing some clarity amidst the broader familial and legal uncertainties. Brown's personal life was riddled with complexities, marked by allegations of domestic abuse and questions about his relationships. Despite these challenges, his influence on the music industry and his contributions to the development of soul and funk music remain undeniable. His legacy as an artist endures, even as his personal life continues to be scrutinized and debated. James Brown's legendary career was marred by allegations of drug use and its associated consequences, casting a shadow over his storied musical legacy. Drug-related charges. For most of his career, Brown was known for his strict no-drugs and alcohol policy for his entourage and band members, often firing those who violated his rules. Despite his outward stance against drug use, some discrepancies exist as he would occasionally serve a highball of Delaware punch and moonshine at his home in St. Albans, Queens, in the mid-1960s. 
The situation took a turn in the 1970s when some members of his band, the JBs, were caught using LSD during a 1971 performance, leading to their immediate termination. Brown himself had a disturbing encounter with PCP in the mid-1970s when his assistant, Bob Patton, accidentally shared a laced marijuana cigarette with him. While Brown claimed he only smoked marijuana, Patton reported that they both experienced intense hallucinations. By the mid-1980s, Brown's drug use became more pronounced, with Vicki Anderson, a former member of Brown's band, attesting to his frequent use of PCP, also known as Angel Dust, from before 1982. Brown's relationship with Adrian Rodriguez, whom he married in 1984, exacerbated the situation as they began using PCP together. This drug use often leads to violent outbursts, resulting in multiple arrests for domestic violence against Rodriguez while under the influence of drugs. In 1988, Brown faced numerous criminal charges related to driving, PCP, and gun possession. His infamous interview on CNN's Sonia Live in LA showcased his erratic behavior and irreverent attitude, with many suspecting he was under the influence during the broadcast. Further accounts of Brown's substance abuse emerged in the years following his death. Former lovers recall Brown's use of PCP and cocaine, often mixed with cigarettes. He also allegedly engaged in off-label use of sildenafil for its energizing effects. His drug-induced paranoia led him to claim that passing plants contained mind-monitoring technology from God. In January 1998, Brown spent a week in rehab to address an unspecified addiction to prescription drugs. However, just a week after his release, he was arrested for illegal gun possession and marijuana use. By the time of his death in December 2006, traces of cocaine were found in his urine upon his admission to Emory University Hospital. Brown's struggles with substance abuse complicate his personal relationships and lead to legal troubles. His widow hinted at the impact of his drug use, noting that he would often have sex with a female acquaintance. Despite his unparalleled influence on the music industry, his battle with drugs casts a tragic light on his later years. The charges relate to theft and assault. His troubles with the law began early, at the age of 16, when he was convicted of theft and served three years in juvenile detention. One of the most notorious incidents occurred in 1963 during a concert at Club 15 in Macon, Georgia. Brown, reportedly armed with two handguns, got into a violent altercation with his musical rival, Joe Tex, while Otis Redding was performing. The conflict escalated, leaving several people shot and stabbed. Although Brown was still on parole at the time, his agent, Clint Bradley, and some cash helped smooth over the situation. Witnesses reported that a man appeared afterward, handing out cash to the wounded to keep them quiet. Brown faced no charges from this incident. In subsequent years, Brown continued to face legal challenges. On July 16, 1978, he was arrested for failing to file necessary paperwork from one of his radio stations after it filed for bankruptcy. In 1988, he faced a series of charges, including assault, drug possession, and weapon charges. A high-speed chase on Interstate 20 near the Georgia-South Carolina border led to his arrest on September 24 of the same year. He was convicted of carrying a gun without a license and assaulting a police officer, among other charges. Brown was sentenced to six years in prison but was released on parole after serving two years. In 1998, Brown faced a civil lawsuit from Mary Simons, who accused him of holding her captive for three days, demanding oral sex and shooting a gun in his office. Simon's charges were eventually dismissed. Another civil suit was filed by former background singer Lisa Rushton, who accused Brown of sexual harassment and unfair treatment. Rushton eventually withdrew her lawsuit. A third lawsuit came from Lisa Agbalaya, a former employee, who accused Brown of sexual harassment and wrongful termination. Brown was cleared of the sexual harassment charges but found liable for wrongful termination. On July 3, 2000, Brown was accused of attacking an electric company repairman with a steak knife, although the incident did not lead to serious consequences. In 2003, Brown was pardoned by the South Carolina Department of Probation, Parole, and Pardon Services for past crimes committed in the state. Despite his musical genius and undeniable influence on the industry, Brown's legal struggles and personal controversies often overshadowed his accomplishments, leaving a complex legacy that mixed his talents with a troubled personal life. The charges involved domestic violence and rape. James Brown's turbulent personal life included multiple arrests for domestic violence, particularly involving his relationships with his partners. Between 1987 and 1995, Brown was arrested on four separate occasions for allegedly assaulting his third wife, Adrian Rodriguez. 
During one of the most severe incidents, Rodriguez told authorities that Brown had beaten her with an iron pipe and even fired shots at her car. The situation escalated to the point where Rodriguez had to be hospitalized after an assault in October 1995. However, the charges against Brown were dropped following Rodriguez's death in January 1996. Brown's domestic violence issues didn't end there. In January 2004, Brown faced another arrest in South Carolina, this time on charges of domestic violence against Tommy Ray Heine. Heine accused Brown of pushing her to the floor during an argument at their home, resulting in scratches and bruising on her right arm and hip. Brown pleaded not guilty to the charges in June 2004 and did not serve jail time. Instead, his punishment consisted of forfeiting his $1,000 bail. In January 2005, a woman named Jacques Hollander filed a lawsuit against Brown, alleging that he raped her in 1988. The case was initially dismissed in 2002 due to the expiration of the statute of limitations for filing the lawsuit. Hollander claimed that the stress from the assault led her to develop Graves' disease, a chronic thyroid condition. She stated that the incident occurred in South Carolina while she was working for Brown as a journalist. Hollander claimed that Brown had pulled over while they were driving together in a truck, and sexually assaulted her while threatening her with a gun. In the case against Brown, Hollander provided evidence including a DNA sample and polygraph test results. However, the court did not consider the evidence due to procedural limitations. Hollander then attempted to take her case to the Supreme Court, but her appeal was unsuccessful. These legal battles painted a troubling picture of Brown's personal relationships and behavior, overshadowing his musical achievements and leaving a lasting impact on his legacy health and death. Despite his age and health challenges, including type 2 diabetes and a successful battle with prostate cancer in 2004, Brown remained active and committed to his music career. On December 23, 2006, Brown became critically ill and visited a dentist's office in Atlanta for dental implant work. The dentist noticed that Brown appeared weak and dehydrated and recommended he seek medical attention immediately. Following the dentist's advice, Brown went to Emory Crawford Long Memorial Hospital for a medical examination on December 24. His longtime manager and friend, Charles Bobbitt, mentioned that Brown had been struggling with a persistent cough since returning from a European tour in November. Brown was hopeful he would be discharged from the hospital in time for his scheduled New Year's Eve performances in New Jersey and New York, as well as a live performance on CNN's New Year's Eve special. However, his condition worsened, and he remained hospitalized as his health continued to decline. On Christmas Day, December 25, 2006, Brown passed away at approximately 1.45 a.m. EST at the age of 73. The cause of death was congestive heart failure resulting from complications of pneumonia. Bobbitt was by his bedside and recalled Brown's final moments, in which he declared, I'm going away tonight, before passing peacefully. Following his death, an investigation in 2019 suggested that Brown may have been murdered, raising questions about the circumstances surrounding his death. Nevertheless, Brown's passing marked the end of an era in the music industry. Brown's legacy was honored with a series of elaborate memorial services. A public memorial was held on December 28, 2006, at the Apollo Theater in New York City, and on December 30, 2006, at the James Brown Arena in Augusta, Georgia. Thousands of fans, family members, and celebrities attended the events, including Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Little Richard, Prince, and many others. Brown's final resting place was a crypt at his daughter's home in Beach Island, South Carolina. His memorial services were grand and featured costume changes for Brown, as well as videos of his concerts. His body was placed in a Promethean casket of gold-polished bronze, which was carried through the streets of New York to the Apollo Theater in a white glass-encased horse-drawn carriage. In Augusta, Georgia, the memorial procession passed by a statue of Brown on its way to the James Brown Arena. During the public memorial service in Augusta, attendees heard Brown's soulful rendition of Georgia on My Mind. His final backup act, Soul Generals, played some of his hits during an arena tribute, joined by Bootsy Collins and MC Hammer. James Brown's extraordinary musical talent and vibrant personality made him one of the most influential figures in music history. His contributions to the industry, particularly in the genres of funk and soul, continue to resonate with audiences worldwide. Dispute over inheritance rights. James Brown, the iconic godfather of soul, signed his last will and testament on August 1, 2000, in the presence of J. Strom Thurmond Jr., an estate attorney. His will, designed as an irrevocable trust, 
was established to manage his estate, including personal assets such as clothing, cars, and jewelry. It also encompassed his musical rights, business assets from James Brown Enterprises, and his Beach Island, South Carolina estate. During the reading of his will on January 11, 2007, it was revealed that six of Brown's surviving adult children were named as beneficiaries, Terry, Larry, Daryl, Yama Brown Lumar, Deanna Brown Thomas, and Venetia Brown. Notably absent from the will were Brown's widow, Tommy Ray Heine, and their son James II. Brown's will was signed months before the birth of James II and over a year before Brown married Heine. The irrevocable trust established in 2000 meant that there could be no changes made to include James II or Heine as beneficiaries. On January 24, 2007, Brown's children filed a lawsuit seeking the removal of the estate's individual representatives, including Brown's attorney and trustee Albert, Buddy, Dallas. They also requested the appointment of a special administrator due to concerns of potential mismanagement and impropriety. A week later, on January 31st, Heine challenged Brown's estate, questioning the validity of the will and requesting recognition as Brown's legal widow and James II's mother. The legal battle took a significant turn on January 27, 2015, when Judge Doyot Early III ruled in favor of Heine, declaring her as Brown's official widow based on the invalidation of her prior marriage and Brown's abandonment of his attempt to annul their marriage. However, the South Carolina Supreme Court later overturned this decision in 2020, ruling that Heine was not legally married to Brown and therefore had no rights to his estate. In July 2021, after 15 years of legal disputes, the Brown family finally reached a settlement, bringing an end to the long-standing legal battle over Brown's estate. The resolution marked a significant moment for the family and closed a tumultuous chapter in the legendary artist's legacy. In the total number of properties in dispute and up for auction includes the Brown Mansion on Beach Island. James Brown's Beach Island Mansion in South Carolina stands as a testament to the life and legacy of the legendary Godfather of Soul. Since Brown's passing on Christmas Day in 2006, the mansion has undergone significant changes, with much of it being looted during an auction held by Christie's. Despite this, some notable items and features of the estate have remained intact, thanks to the efforts of dedicated individuals who have worked tirelessly to preserve Brown's personal belongings and the mansion's unique characteristics. One such individual is Russell Bachnight, an estate agent and water enthusiast who contributed to the creation of the mansion's stunning waterfall. His efforts, along with those of curator David Washington, have been pivotal in safeguarding the mansion and its contents. Washington's keen eye for detail has helped to maintain the safety of Brown's nutrition and the estate's various artifacts. The mansion boasts a sunken tobacco bar in the atrium, surrounded by covered doorways along the walls of the polygonal structure. A magnificent chandelier hangs from the ceiling in the lobby, adding a touch of grandeur to the space. The entrance room leads to a living room adorned with a couch, fireplace, and checkered floors, offering a glimpse into the opulence that once defined Brown's lifestyle. Preserved within the mansion is a display case housing original James Brown memorabilia, including his iconic, Get Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, record, alongside other archival items. Although many of Brown's belongings were looted for auction, these treasured possessions were spared, allowing fans and historians alike to appreciate Brown's impact on the music world. Additionally, James Brown's clothes and shoes remain in their rightful place within the mansion, meticulously photographed, tagged, and catalogued. The salon's exterior, along with hair products, hair dryers, towels, blankets, and other items, provide a glimpse into Brown's personal grooming habits. While the estate may no longer reflect the same splendor it once did, the efforts of Bach Knight, Washington, and others ensure that Brown's memory and the essence of his life are kept alive for generations to come. But though James Brown may have left this world, his spirit lives on in the hearts of those who continue to dance to the rhythm of his songs. Don't forget to leave a like, share and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this video and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.